Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar. So my name is Estelle and uh, today we will talk about the importance of the ISO 11133 standard for the preparation and performance testing of culture media that is used for microbiology testing of food and of feed and of water also. Um, so we will take a slightly different angle maybe that you're used to is that we will talk about water. Um, we'll discuss, you know, how to select a, a good water source that can really help you improve both our test accuracy and reproducibility and also your lab efficiency lab. and productivity. All right, so our agenda today. So my colleague Barbara Gerton will talk uh, about the the ISO uh, 11133 standard, you know, why it's important, and she will give uh, some important highlights about it. Then um, we will move into the water quality that is required to um, prepare media. And then I will discuss uh, a comparative study that we can do conducted and uh, um, share with you the, the results uh, from it where because we compared two different sources of water and in the end we will give you some tips about how to select uh, the best water solution for your media preparation. All right so now I will give the hand to my colleague Barbara. Barbara can you tell us a little bit about the ISO 11133 standard please? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, welcome also from my side and thanks for the nice introduction to Barbara and Estelle. So to give you an uh, <clears throat> overview and a background information of ISO 11133, why it is important. First, the ISO 11133 is an EN ISO standard. That means a full European and international standard. It is a mandatory standard, means it is requested standard for all accredited labs, which are accredited on methods of ISO standards for the microbiological testing of food, animal, feed or water. Accredited means here accredited as a testing lab for samples from food, animal, feed and water for the microbiological <coughs> testing. Uh, and the accreditation is according to ISO 17025. Most ISO standards in food and water microbiology include now a normative reference to this ISO 11133 for the preparation and testing of culture media. Normative means that the ISO 11133 has to be used beside the other standards for food and water microbiological testing, for example, besides the Salmonella standard or Listeria standard. Therefore, the ISO 11133 is indispensable uh, for their application. And ISO 11133 is the only worldwide available standard for the quality assurance and testing of culture media in food and water. The ISO 11133 describes the general methodology and specifications for preparation and testing of culture media in the area of food animal feed and water microbiology. When specific standards are now revised or new standards are developed, they will include a paragraph for performance testing of the culture media used in this standard. But the general methodology, how to prepare a medium, how to test a culture medium for microbiology is still described in ISO 11133. ISO 11133 is published as a European ISO standard, EN ISO. The base standard has been published in 2014. A first amendment has been published in 2018. And a second amendment has been published recently in 2020. So you see here on the right hand the cover pages of the base standard from 2014 and below the cover pages of the both amendments. 
These both amendments are complementary to the base standard. So you have to use all three documents together. The amendment 1 from 2018 contains corrections and additional information. Amendment 2 from 2020 gives the test microorganisms to be used for confirmation, media and reagents. These were not included in the base uh, document from 2014. All these documents are available from the ISO web store, www.iso.org, and from the national standardization bodies. It's also available beside English in other languages like French, German, Russian and Spanish. Some highlights from the ISO 11133. The ISO 11133 specifies the requirements for the preparation of culture media and describes the methods for the performance testing of those culture media for microbiology intended for the microbiological analysis of food and animal feed and samples from the food or feed production environment, as well as all kinds of water intended for consumption or used in the food production itself. For whom does ISO 11133 apply? It applies to end users in the lab for ready to, of ready-to-use media. For laboratories, to laboratories preparing their own culture media and to manufacturers producing culture media and selling these to the laboratories. It applies to all formats of culture media for the use in laboratories, for the microbiology of course, prepared from single ingredients, prepared from dehydrated products, as well as ready to use media. The standard 11133 describes in detail the terms and definitions on culture media and their test microorganisms. The whole complex and um, topics on quality assurance management, including documentation, laboratory preparation of culture media, storage and shelf life of lab prepared media, and of course, the quality control and performance testing, including the physical and chemical control, the test on microbiological contamination of the media, the big topic on microbiological growth control of solid and liquid media, and a section on troubleshooting. And in, it includes also a detailed description for the preparation and handling of the test microorganisms for the performance testing of the culture media. Besides this main topic, it has a lot of other topics included in the standard. The standard itself has more than 120 20 pages and uh, all topics around the quality assurance of culture media. The microbiological quality control according ISO 11133 is including examples of quantitative and qualitative testing methods for solid and liquid media. The testing of diluents, the testing of confirmation media and reagents. And besides this description, it includes also the acceptance criteria, which are mandatory to be specified before and tested before using these media for the quality control, for the microbiological control of the samples. When culture media are intended for quantitative purposes, quantitative testing methods shall be performed. For surface or port plate technique, the usage of the medium is in the way as the medium in routine procedure is used in the lab means if you are using your culture medium with surface plating technique, the quality control, the performance testing is also done by surface plating and the same for port plate technique. Solid media used with membranes, with the membrane filtration, have to be tested in combinations with the membrane filters 
using the membrane filtration procedure. As you are using your membranes and your culture media in the lab for the microbiological control of your food or feed samples. The inoculated culture media are then incubated in accordance with the conditions as used in the routine lab analysis. ISO 11133 describes in detail the test microorganisms for the performance testing, including their selection, their preservation and maintenance, and preparation for the different tests. The standard includes also flowcharts on maintenance and preparation, description, and better illustration. ISO 11133 and the specific standards together give a panel of specific strains selected for the testing in order to ensure consistency between laboratories and to facilitate the demonstration of differences between media, batch-to-batch -batch differences, but also differences uh, between media provided by different manufacturers. These strains, which are given in the standards, have been fully evaluated to ensure their suitability and consistency in the performance. Additional strains can be used, of course. For example, additional strains can be wild isolates from your samples, but could be also strains from proficiency testing. But these are always to be used additionally. Where applicable, strains used in the European Pharmacopoe, the so-called EP, have been taken into account, especially for those laboratories having uh, samples from uh, pharmaceutical area and from uh, food or water uh, area. The ISO 11133 gives the methods how to test the culture media. And the specific standard, like the standard for testing on Salmonella or Listeria, gives the details of the performance testing, like the incubation, the specific control strains, and the criteria, which means how the strains should look like after the testing on the plates. When a, a, a standard um, lists more than one strain, for each aspect of the performance testing, the productivity, the selectivity, the specificity, the minimum strains to be used by the lab user have been indicated by a very small b. It is also indicated in the picture of these uh, tables in the middle, uh, in the slide on the right side. Uh, it is a very small b. Uh, which is at the strain or at the number of the strain. The test strains are those from the catalog of universal strain identifiers, which are compiled by the World Data Center of Microorganisms, the so-called WDCM. More details on the WDCM strains you can find on the website. The WDCM number is given now in all ISO standards, not only in those for food and water testing, also in standards for disinfections and others. The WDCM uh, strain number, which you can see in the list here at the bottom, for example, for the Escherichia coli, the WDCM 00012. Behind this WDCM, you have the strain numbers of those national culture collections which are holding this same strain. So this strain listed in ISO standards by the WDCM number can be used from the different national culture collections indicated in this list. The, of course, a US ATCC culture collection, uh, the Spanish CECT, the German DSM culture collection and the um, culture collection NCTC from United Kingdom are uh, most often used examples, but also others. This ensures 
that in many countries, local sources of these culture strains from the local national culture collections can be used for the same testing of the same medium. Of course, ISO 11133 also requires documentation. It requires the documentation from manufacturer or producer, including the name of the medium, individual components and any supplements, including, if possible, their product codes, technical data sheets, including formulation, intended use, filling quantity, uh, if applicable, and references. Of course, safety and or hazard data sheets, batch number, the target pH of the complete medium, the storage information and expiry date, the assigned shelf life, and a quality control certificate showing test organisms used and results of performance testing with criteria of acceptance. This information altogether shall be available from the manufacturer. What about the documentation required from the laboratory prepare, preparing their own media? When a bottle of dehydrated medium is opened, date is a container and indicate a maximum storage time. When media are prepared from dehydrated commercial formulations, follow, of course, the manufacturer's instructions precisely. Document all relevant data, for example, the code and lot number, the mass and volume, the pH, the date of preparation, the check of condu conductivity of the water used, sterilization conditions and operator or operators. The so ISO 11133 has also an example of a record card which can be used for the own standard operation procedure for the documentation of the lab user. The so ISO 11133 Three gives also a guidance for troubleshooting. This guidance is in an informative Annex H, listing different abnormalities and possible reasons. For example, an abnormality could be that the agar medium fails to solidify. Then possible reasons could be overheating, a low pH, an incorrect mass of the agar used, it could be also that the agar, which has to be uh, solved um, precisely uh, with a higher temperature, was not uh, good dissolved. Or it could uh, be also the reason of a, a poor mixing of ingredients. For example, for an abnormality uh, like the incorrect pH at the end, the reason could be overheating of the medium during the preparation, but could be also poor water quality, for example. Could be others from contamination, could be also that the pH meter was not correctly calibrated, or poor quality of the dehydrated medium. But very often the poor water quality could be a possible reason. And this brings us now to one of our main topics of uh, today's webinar, the water quality to prepare the culture media. Why it is so important? Because the culture media mostly consists of more than 90% of water. Using poor water quality can cause many abnormalities, more than in the slide before, given in annex in the annex age of ISO 11133, the abnormal color, the incorrect pH, the formation of a precipitate. It could cause also as that the medium is inhibitory or has a low productivity for the target microorganisms. It could cause also that the medium is contaminated because many media needs only heating and not autoclaving. So having this in mind, how to select the right water quality for the media preparation? And to answer these questions, I would like to hand over to my colleague Estelle. 
Thank you, Barbara. All right, so how uh, to select the right water quality? Well, actually, there is a, a, an entire section about this topic um, in uh, it's, it's section 433. Um, and we will go through what it says because it has some very nice details. So the first thing is, of course, um, it requires that you use purified a purified water source. Um, so you have a choice. It can be um, distilled water. It can be demineralized or deionized water. It can be water produced by reverse osmosis um, or an equivalent quality of water. So basically, the idea is, of course, you would not want to use you know, tap water. It needs to be um, uh, purified quite a bit. Now, how purified should it be? Um, so the the um, the standard says that uh, the water should be free from substances that are likely to inhibit or influence the microorganism growth under the test conditions. So um, the main contaminants um, they mention is um, the presence of chlorine. Of course, you can well imagine that it will uh, impact your your uh, microorganisms, but also ammonia and uh, metal ions. Um, principally, um, heavy metals would be um, some contaminants to, to avoid for sure, uh, as they may have an impact on microorganisms. Now, um, another important um, way um, to, to assess the, the quality of, uh, of water is to look at the conductivity. So the reason why um, people look at the conductivity is because just extremely pure water, uh, ultra pure water is uh, almost does not conduct electricity because it contains only very, very few ions. Um, and actually the measure of conductivity represents the amount of ions. So the more ions that are present in water, the more that water will conduct electricity. And so here, um, the um, the standard um, requires that the resistivity should be uh, above 0 0.04 um, megom centimeter, or you know, the equivalent is uh, below 25 micro siemens per centimeter of uh, conductivity. Well, uh, resistivity, you know, it's the um, is one over the the conductivity, but preferably it should be less than five micro siemens per centimeter. And the other important uh, point is that conductivity or resistivity should be checked before use. Why? Um, because as um, purified water um, is kept, is stored, um, its quality may uh, degrade with time. And this is uh, also the reason why uh, water storage is mentioned, because the, the best way would be to use freshly purified water. The more you wait, the more you store water, the more you have a risk that it will um, become contaminated. And that's the reason why it's important to store that water in a tightly closed container and also in a container made uh, with an inert material that will not contaminate the water. So either, you know, glass, good quality glass or polyethylene, for example. Another very important um, topic is the level of microbial contamination. So that, that seems quite uh, um, logical that um, there should not be um, too, too much bi uh, microbiological contamination in the water that you will use to prepare your, your media. So it should not exceed uh, 10 to the power 3 uh, CFU per ml and preferably um, 10 to the power, it should be inferior to 10 to the power 2 um, CFU per ml. And finally, there's a note in this section that's quite interesting. It says that um, if you choose to use water uh, produced by an ion exchange resin, you know, demineralized water, um, you have to be careful because it can have very high microorganism content. And in that case, um, you should um, not use it without first checking the microbial content of the water. All right, so let's let's take a little step back, you know, and think back about why all these requirements regarding water and water quality. Well, 
So the first question to ask ourselves is what's usually in water? You know, what's in, in your tap water? Um, there are several families of contaminants that may be present. So the first one might be bacteria. You know, this is the topic and <laughs> the most important topic for us today. Um, so normally in tap water, there should not be too many bacteria because they're controlled, you know, by chlorination or ozonation. But of course, our tap water is far from sterile and it does contain some bacteria that are not uh, dangerous for us to drink, but that may have an impact on, on your media, right? And on your experiments in the lab. Are there another family of uh, contaminants that may be present in water are ions. So we mentioned this um, just before. So the, there can be many different ions in water, you know, because they come from um, the natural water, you know, when, when it was in contact with the soil, with rocks in, in, in nature. Um, so there's things like, you know, calcium, magnesium, um, things like this. And, uh, and we mentioned earlier, there may be some, some metals and in particular some heavy metals that uh, could be you know low enough though, so they are not dangerous for our health if we drink but high enough to have an impact on um, your preparation in the lab another family of contaminants are particles so you know it can be um, you know soft particles like uh, debris from from plants for example or it could be um, harder particles like sand or small small things like this or uh, colloids like uh, silica for example other things that could be present in your tap water are organic molecules. So organic molecules, they can come from nature as well, you know, from the decay of uh, plants and leaves, you know, like uh, humic acid, things like this. But organic molecules may also come from human activity. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, small residues of, uh, of pesticides or of medications that we take, um, potentially even um, you know, antibiotics and things like this that we take. So uh, again, you know, since there are some very strict regulations about tap water, those levels should be very low, but still they may be high enough that it could impact uh, the preparation of your media. It could maybe cause um, some precipitation or some change in color you know we were just discussing this earlier so that could be the reason you know along with ions of course the last family which is probably a little bit less uh, important in our case would be dissolved gases um, things like you know nitrogen oxygen carbon dioxide could be present in in your tap water so these are the five big families of uh, of water contaminants and now the question is, okay, the ISO 11133 mentions different kinds of uh, purified water that you can use, right? Because we, we all realize, of course, we should not use tap water. So you have a choice. You could use distilled water, deionized, reverse osmosis. Okay, what, what's the difference between all those? Let's, let's see this. So the first one and probably the one type of purified water you probably know the most because um, we'll see this maybe in school and, and, and all this is uh, distilled water, right? So in distillation, um, basically the idea is uh, water is, is boiled and uh, then it evaporates and the vapor is then condensed. Um, and so that's, that's a very, very old uh, way of purifying water. And the great thing is that it removes uh, almost all of our different families of contaminants really quite well. Um, the only contaminant it does not remove quite as well probably are organics because especially organic molecules that boil close to 100 degrees, you know, similar to water, may be carried along. So may be present in your distilled water. Also, distillation is a pretty slow process. So while it is being performed, water may uh, recontaminate itself a little bit. Another way of purifying water that you may have in your lab is deionization. So, you know, this is done uh, with uh, ion exchange resins. Usually you see those, you know, they're in big big bottles. And so these ion exchange resins, they may be either positively charged and then 
retain negatively charged um, ions or they may be negatively charged and then they will retain positively charged ions. So they will, um, it's a great, great method to remove ions and to remove charged organic molecules. However, it will not remove the other contaminants at all. That's one, one drawback of this, uh, this technique. Um, another drawback is that, um, those resins with time, those resins may, um, become saturated and may not be as efficient at, uh, removing, uh, ions as at the beginning. And so they will need to be regenerated. So this is usually done with some chemicals. Um, and then, so there is a, a, another technique that's called electrodeionization. And that technique removes exactly the same things, ions and charged organics, but that one uses an electrical current. And uh, that current allows um, this uh, EDI to be continuously regenerated. So that way it doesn't need to be regenerated on a regular basis and it gives constant water quality with time. There's no need to stop and, you know, exchange the, um, the resin. Another technique that is mentioned in the ISO is uh, reverse osmosis. So, you know, this one is done with a, a membrane that has very, very small pores. And so water is pushed through those pores um, that are so small that they will retain all those different contaminants and only water molecules can go through, really. So it, it's very efficient at removing ions, bacteria, organics, and particles. Um, the only drawback of that one is that it needs uh, quite a bit of energy to pump the water through. And also, these membranes are a little bit um, sensitive to things like uh, chlorine, for example, and they need to be protected. So this is uh, the reason for the next purification technology uh, I'm mentioning here, which is activated carbon. So usually this is placed before the reverse osmosis, and it's a way to retain chlorine, chloramine, and it also retains some organic molecules as well. Um, there is another very important purification technology uh, for you if you if you prepare media. It's ultraviolet light. You know that uh, this type of light can be used to um, inactivate bacteria. It will not not kill them, but it will inactivate them. Um, and then there's also 0.22 micron filtration, right? That will also retain bacteria and retain particles. So you can see there are a lot of different kinds of uh, ways you can um, have your water purified. Um, probably none of them is um, totally perfect. And that's the reason why in many cases nowadays, there are some water purification systems where different technologies are mixed together in order to um, to get the best result, you know, to, to use the, the fact that they are complementary. Now, um, how is water quality um, monitored? Well, the main ways is what we were just discussing um, before. It's the resistivity or the conductivity. So this technique measures the, um, the amount of ions that are left in the water. And then uh, we would love to have a way to measure bacteria, right? Um, unfortunately, at this time, um, there is not really a, an easy way to automatically uh, and instant, instantaneously uh, measure uh, bacteria inline. So this, unfortunately, still needs to be done um, offline at this time. Okay, so now let's think about um, there is a, you know, the, the, probably the most often used uh, way of purifying uh, water is demineralized water. So we decided to conduct a study where we would compare um, media that was prepared with uh, centrally produced deionized water um, and compare this with media prepared with uh, water from a water purification system. And the idea was to try to identify a way to um, reduce the risk of having to repeat tests, to avoid doubts about water quality, 
to have a, a way to work, you know, have water in a very easy to use and ergonomic way, and also improve data traceability and recording. So the idea is, how can we help you improve your lab efficiency and productivity while still having excellent results? So how was uh, this study conducted? What we did is um, we worked with a, a QC lab that was um, that is accredited as a registered test lab according to the German um, DIN EN uh, ISO IEC 17025 for the performance testing of media according to the German um, ISO 11133. And in this lab, um, they tested seven different dehydrated culture media. Um, so um, each one of them was prepared with two different water sources and the two were compared. So um, we looked at uh, physical and uh, chemical aspects of, of the media and we also um, checked the performance testing as described in, in the ISO 11133. So this is um, what those um, media were. So we selected some uh, solid media and some liquid media because we wanted to be uh, quite representative. Um, and we focused on uh, media also that was uh, for important pathogens, you know, like Listeria, for example, Salmonella, and uh, hygiene indicators, for example, but others as well. And so the idea was to compare two different sources of water, right? So one was what uh, the lab had uh, in hand, which was uh, water, demineralized water that uh, was available for the entire um, site, actually, that came from uh, from a loop, you know, was available at the tap uh, in the lab. And also um, water from a water purification system that was installed in that lab. So, first of all, so all seven media were prepared with the two different types of water. And the first thing um, they did is looked at uh, really the physical parameters, you know, look at the color, look at the pH um, and the clarity, for example, the, the appearance. And uh, really what, uh, what they observed was that both water sources gave absolutely similar results for all seven of the media tested. So here I'm not showing all seven, um, just for, for convenience uh, and not to bore you too much, but uh, um, if you want to see all the data, it's uh, it's available in an application note that you can uh, obtain also from, from this site. Um, so I invite you to, to have a look at it uh, for more details. Okay, now some of the other outcomes, I will ask um, my colleague Barbara to uh, to come and, and uh, help me um, explain the um, how the performance testing was uh, was performed and, and what the outcomes were. Barbara? Yes, thank you very much, Estelle. Thank you. One example, thank you very much. Uh, one example we want to explain more in detail is um, the chromogenic selective agar, listeria agar, according to Ottaviani and Agosti, uh, for enumeration of listeria monocytogenes. Enumeration means it is a medium which is used quantitative for quantitative testing. That means that productivity has to be tested quantitative. If you see it here on the left part, uh, the function and method of control. So the productivity has to be tested quantitative. Uh, besides this, as it is a selective medium, it has to be tested um, on this by qualitative method. And the specificity has also to be tested because this medium has um, uh, in, in its function as a chromogenic medium, uh, it is a solid medium which shows specific reactions uh, for Listeria monocytogenes. You see a small picture on the right hand of Listeria monocytogenes on this medium. 
The strains to be tested are also specified by the ISO standard, which are um, two Listeria strains, uh, two E. coli strains, two Enterococci strains for selectivity, and one Listeria and Ocoa strain for specificity. These strains are given in the ISO standard, and it is expected from the manufacturer to test them all. For the user, they, uh, it is not mandatory to test them all. Uh, they are selected with a small b, as explained before. For the productivity testing, we need a recovery rate to be tested. The same strains on the agar listeria and on triptych soy agar, and then to compare the recovery rate after incubation. And then the recovery rate has to be more than 50%. Uh, the two Listeria monocytogenous strains uh, have the specification to show blue-green colonies, as you see on the small picture, with an opaque halo, uh, especially when you look against uh, light, um, you see the opaque halo, and the rest of the medium is clear. You see it a little bit on the small picture. So uh, both Listeria strains uh, passed this and showed the same uh, reactions, the same colony morphology with both water qualities. And also for the selectivity, the four strains uh, tested showed the same passed and showed total inhibition. The specificity with uh, Listeria in Ocoa is uh, that this listeria is uh, showing also blue-green uh, colonies, but without the opaque halo. And that is the differentiation against the listeria monocytogenes. And um, this uh, passed also with both water quality. Uh, this is an example for a solid medium and a special medium of a chromogenic and selective medium. So it's a, it's really sensible medium for the preparation. And uh, we expect if there is uh, any differences in the water quality to see this. The second example is The Rappaport Vassiliadis medium uh, the, with soy, uh, with the so-called AVS broth for the selective enrichment of Salmonella. Here, for the productivity of this liquid medium, the target strain of Salmonella is tested with two non-target strains to um, inoculate the or to show the growth of Salmonella which is inoculated in one tube with a low level. In the same tube, two non-target strains are inoculated, in this case Escherichia coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, with a high number of cells. Why is this done in the same tube? It is done to show and to mimic a real-life situation in a food matrix, because mostly you have uh, pathogens um, in combination with non-pathogens in the same food. So this is the reason why we inoculate the salmonella in the same tube um, with two non-target strains. After incubation, from this tube, it is um, uh, subcultured, a portion is subcultured, on the selective agar XLD, where only Salmonella will grow, and to show that the Salmonella were able to grow in the presence of the E. coli and Pseudomonas in the tube. So for both water quality, it passed, and the Salmonella showed the required black colony, black centered colonies on the XLD agar. But what about the selectivity? On the XLD agar, we cannot see the selective inhibition, the selectivity. For that, we need two additional tubes, one for E. coli, one for Enterococcus. And after incubation, these both tubes are then um, subcultured to inoculate triptych soy agar. Triptych soy agar is a non-selective medium showing growth of both. And for both, the um, growth have to be partially or more or less fully inhibited as specified in the ISO standard. And uh, for both, we had similar reactions for both water qualities. 
This is an example uh, for a selective enrichment medium for a pathogen uh, where we expect if we have main differences also differences in especially in the enrichment of the salmonella. So as explained before, both water sources gave similar results for all seven media tested. And you can download um, all the detailed um, results from this study in the application note, as my colleague Estelle has explained. And with this, I would like to hand over again to Estelle. Yes, yes. So just uh, as, a, as a conclusion, so basically, um, in all cases, uh, each of the media prepared really successfully passed the uh, the performance tests, and we really obtained similar outcomes with the two different kinds of water. So that what this means is that the um, the water purification system that we um, tested could be uh, really used with uh, confidence to prepare the microbiological uh, culture media according to um, the standard. Uh, now, let's finish by uh, giving you a few hints about how to select a water purification uh, solution for your media preparation. So we, we discussed earlier, right, the different types of um, purification technologies that could be combined in order to obtain really the, the best water um, quality you, you can uh, hope for for this uh, media preparation. So by combining all of those, um, you will have um, the quality required by, by the standard. Um, and also here you can see there is a, a monitoring inside the, um, the system so you can uh, follow how um, good the uh, the water quality is as well and the important thing is um, as indicated into the in the standard there, there is a, um, a storage tank that is made of uh, polyethylene so it's it's very um, inert and uh, there are some uh, uv lamps uh, both inside the uh, storage tank to keep the um, the water quality uh, uh, the best possible and also the water is regularly recirculated over this lamp um, in order to really uh, make sure the water is always um, of good quality. And then the water is delivered through um, a 0 0.22 uh, micron final filter. So this is what, uh, for example, a system might look like. So it delivers water that answers all the requirements uh, of the standards. So low conductivity, low microbial count. Um, it, uh, it, there is monitoring and the water is um, uh, freshly purified or, at or stored in a tank that is made of uh, inert material. So this uh, checks all the uh, uh, requirements uh, regarding the, uh, the water quality for sure. But um, just one last thing I wanted to mention is there are some additional um, features of uh, water purification systems that can really help you uh, increase the lab, your lab's efficiency and productivity. Like, for example, you can have um, a foot pedal that will allow you to um, have, you know, both hands free to work. And so you don't need to touch the dispenser and uh, in order to get uh, to get water, just do it with your foot. Um, water systems also have uh, very easy and intuitive uh, touch screens, um, so um, it's easy to see at all times uh, the water quality parameters, and uh, and really it's very efficient way, very simple uh, to use. Um, another uh, nice uh, feature is uh, volumetric dispensing, so you can decide uh, the volume you need of water and just just press on a button and uh, you can go and do something else. And during that time, the system will uh, deliver exactly the volume you, you wanted and stop. And, uh, and that way you don't have to, you know, stay in front of the system and watch it as it delivers water. Uh, also the dispensers, they can be placed wherever you want in, in the lab. So that will also help you, you know, with the flexibility and, uh, and help your, your, lab productivity, you don't have to um, go far away to, to get the water. Um, 
one other thing is uh, the maintenance. So water purification systems, especially modern ones, um, have been developed. Uh, so it's very, very easy to change the cartridges. And usually on the um, on the screen, it tells you there is a wizard that tells you how, how to do the, um, the simple uh, regular maintenance. And you may also choose to um, to have a uh, a service plan that will help you, you know, do the, the preventative maintenance so you, you can be sure the, the system will always work in an optimal way and uh, also give you uh, access to a, a digital service portal so you can uh, actually have an online solution for your maintenance. And finally, systems can provide you also data traceability. So you can actually, um, you know, they, they store the information about the water quality and the uh, the way the system was used, you know, how often it was used, when and, and all that. And so that can really help you, uh, for example, with your with your audits as the, this uh, data can be retrieved very easily. Okay, so as a conclusion, um, the uh, the ISO 11133 standard describes the methodology and the specifications for the preparation and testing of culture media, and uh, preparing this uh, culture media with constant and uh, reliable water quality will ensure reproducibility and accuracy. And um, water purification system can actually bring you additional benefits in addition to uh, delivering high quality water is that uh, they can uh, they're very easy to use they, they're very convenient uh, they bring uh, data traceability which is uh, super important um, uh, nowadays and also they can be autonomous you know from the rest of uh, of your buildings so you don't have to worry about you know if there is maintenance done or something on your on your loop and uh, they can also um, be a step towards meeting your sustainability goals because now there are some systems that contain for example uh, uh, mercury free uv lamps uh, and that consume a lot less electricity and and water than than in the past so um, this is uh, this is it for me. I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I will give the hand back to our moderator. Well, thank you, Estelle. Um, first, I want to thank you and Barbara for a great presentation. Um, certainly, when I was back in the lab, if I had foot pedal to uh, dispense water, that would have made my life a lot easier. Um, but before we have the two of you address some of the questions that have been submitted, I want to remind all our participants that we'd love your feedback and you'll see a, a webinar survey pop up uh, that will help us improve our programs that we offer you. So one question we have is, um, and I'll ask Barbara this, uh, what is the frequency of, of water testing that, uh, that's outlined by the standard? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, question. So the standard ISO 11133 gives no frequency for the microbiological testing. ISO 11133 says it should be regularly monitored. From personal experience, it is recommended to state the frequency uh, of the water testing um, according to the frequency of preparation of the culture media. For example, a weekly testing in case that every day culture media are prepared and for example, a monthly testing for a lab with more rare preparation of culture media. For the conductivity mm -hmm. resistance of water used in the laboratory, ISO 11133 said should be checked before use for the preparation of culture media. That's interesting. So no more specifications than that. I guess it's uh, based on your use and application. So that's good to know. Um, Estelle, here's a question for you. Um, your study showed that the deionized water and the water that was put through your system essentially passed the performance tests uh, equivalently. But if, if someone were to invest in uh, one of your systems, how will that help them uh, during an audit, for an example, um, over that, that they would get just using 
like the in-house water. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so I said this. I'm sorry. I went a bit fast on 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 this topic, but uh, actually, in um, in in the most recent uh, water purification systems, the um, all the history of uh, of the system. So the, uh, the 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 water quality, the the each time uh, water is being dispensed, and also the system performance, the you know the maintenance, and all, everything is stored in the system for ten years. So um, if you have an audit you can uh, actually retrieve wow. this information for that uh, the period of time when we, you, you use the water and that allows you to show that you know you use the right water quality f during that time that's terrific um, and everything uh, with standards are all about uh, documentation now so that's a great mm -hmm. advantage um, Barbara does the standard cover culture media for other usages besides um, food and beverage like pharmaceutical applications? Um, yes and no, I have to say. Thanks again for this question. Uh, so the standard covers culture media mostly for food and beverage and water testing, microbiological testing, but the testing methods can be applied also for other culture media in beverages, in pharmaceutical um, culture media, for example, also. Especially in those cases where there is no companion description for the testing in the uh, pharmacopoe, uh, like European pharmacopoe, US pharmacopoe, or Japanese pharmacopoe. For example, um, the US pharmacopoe, USP, knows also ISO 11133, and uh, the general chapter 1117, Microbiological Best Laboratory Practices. Um, by published by USP is under revision and um, will be uh, is expected to be published by second half of 2021 in a new revision and it gives in its current revised draft a reference to ISO 11133. So we are very proud in ISO that also USP gives now a reference to this ISO general ISO standard. That's great. Um, so an, another question that came up is uh, one of the um, appendices uh, amendments to the original standard uh, had some corrections. Are there any noteworthy that, that our audience should be aware of that were corrected from the original? Um, the uh, corrections um, were uh, smaller corrections, but um, affecting also, for example, uh, the inoculum, uh, the cells to be used for selectivity testing and specificity testing. Uh, there were also some corrections for the tests for uh, specific media. So um, it should be always use these amendments, uh, especially amendment one, with the corrections together with the base standard side by side. And the amendment two has uh, the tables with the specifications for confirmation, media and reagents, which are also very important in many labs. Great. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions.